one only here and this is my review of Spearhead from Space. The first story of the seventh season of classic Doctor Who starring John Pertwee in his first appearance as the third Doctor. Spearhead from Space is the 51st story overall. It's four episodes long and it's written by Robert Holmes. This is also the final story in which Derek Sherwin produces as Barry Less takes over in the following story, Doctor Who and the Silurians. Previously, we saw the second Doctor's days in travelling in time and space coming to an end when he had to summon the Time Lords to put an end to a dastardly scheme involving soldiers from different wars. And this resulted in the Time Lords exiling the Doctor to 21st, 20th century Earth with a new appearance, plus the, his companions Jamie and Zoe being sent back to their own times with no memory of the travels with the Doctor. So the plot of the Spirit from Space is as follows. Exile. The Time Lords have banished the newly regenerated Doctor to Earth. But the Doctor isn't the only alien to have arrived, as a swarm of meteorites have crashed into the sleepy English countryside, bringing with them a terrible new threat to mankind. As the nesting sh plantic shape unit, the Doctor and his newly appointed scientific advisor, Lishaw, race against time to stop humanity being replaced, replaced by a terrifying plastic facsimile race. From space? What an amazing story. It's actually one of my favourite stories from the Pertwee era and is actually my favourite post generation story for the entire classic Doctor Who. It's just amazing all throughout. The production of this story is just fantastic and it's actually, Spirit from Space is actually the first Doctor Who story to air in colour and it looks absolutely stunning but at the same time I'm kind of sad that we won't be seeing black and white anymore as I did say before in previous reviews that... It does give off that class, that scary atmospheric mood to it, and I guess that's what we have to lose. We got what we gain, we have to lose. But in addition, the look of the story is fairly different to other classic Who stories because the spirit from space is actually shot entirely on film due to as the, I think the television studio is on strike, so the opted have the story filmed in shot on film. And I thought I was watching one of these old James old movies like you see that the James Bond is all filmed or shot on film and and it made the story look very unique to say that and I think this is definitely one of the strengths of this story this story the direction by Derek Martinus was great and this is actually the last story that he directs and as the saying goes always best to save the best for last and this was really good he used a lot of interesting shots and you know these camera pannings and all that was very interesting to to look to the, see I really like the plot in there. I like how it kicks off the exile era for the Doctor uh, and the John Pair 2 era overall and was well, bringing back units and the Brigadier and, and I liked how they become major players for many stories to come in the Pair 2 era. And this is actually the first story to establish that the Doctor has two hearts as was pretty much implied in the classics well, in the first and second Doctor era the Doctor only had one heart. So I think... It makes sense because I think the companions are not really used to the Doctor having two hearts. So I think that's what definitely helps in that. And this is the first time we see the Autons and the Nesting Consciousness for the first time. And I'll get a bit more of them later. The story too had great, even scary moments. Such as the Autons breaking out of the shops and attacking citizens on, on, in, on the high street. And I think the general Scrooge seeing his repl his autumn self and and what happened to him after that was quite scary as well. And I also like the scene when the Doctor was just emerging out of the TARDIS and just collapses on the field. And I also like how the Doctor was also under attack but from the nesting consciousness, which was actually a squid. <laughs> and I think the tentacles was just trying to like choke the choke out the Doctor. It was quite funny as well. And I really like the music from Dudley Simpson. I like how he was able to modify. Yeah, to giving it a new feel to Doctor Who. Considering that now in the 1970s, it has to be somewhat different and more epic. And to the acting of the story, much I say I really liked and everyone involved did a very good job, to say the least. John Pertwee especially, he did an amazing job, considering the fact this is his first story and I really enjoyed his performance. And he doesn't do a whole great deal in episode 1, but he still manages to impress, especially he just regenerated in his bedbound for a good chunk of it and even when he's and he impresses me by when he even when he was dazed I think because because of that post regeneration written it was just pretty much asking for his shoes 
<laughs> and it was so funny. He just he's asking for his shoes, and he just pretty much grabs them and just holds on to them. <laughs> it was a very funny scene, and and he's later abducted and managed to escape in a wheelchair. And that was that was a great scene. It was also kind of funny as well. And when he does get better, he manages to steal clothes and a car from the hospital and heads and heads off to Unit HQ. And when the doctor reaches Unit, this is where we actually get a glimpse of his version of the doctor. He's obviously frustrated that he's stranded on Earth and makes various attempts to escape in the TARDIS but fails to do so because the timelines have pretty much erased the Doctor's memory of the TARDIS... Well, from, I think the TARDIS memory... Like, I think the dematerialization codes from the Doctor's memory so he can't actually take off and... Throughout story, throughout some of the stories, you definitely see the Doctor trying to at least work on the TARDIS. Yes, I think... And I think it was pretty obvious that the Doctor was very frustrated that he's on Earth. And you can definitely see in his character, he's, he's a bit, he's very short-tempered, but in a good way. Because obviously, is I have to understand that he's on Earth and you can't really do anything. You can't travel in space and time anymore. But, and, and that's what I like about his Doctor. And he's actually more serious than his predecessors. Obviously, because of the fact that he's joined on Earth. And he actually does manage to make the best of it. And he can be very comical at times, especially... You, when he's actually being attacked or something, he definitely makes these very weird facial expressions, <laughs> which I absolutely adore from the from the man. And I think the shower scene from episode two was actually a very funny scene as well. <laughs> and the John Part Two Doctor actually reminds me of James Bond, and especially the James Bond era because because of course because it's stuck on Earth, it definitely has some James Bond aspects too. Because a lovely car, beautiful women, mastermind villains, the master, for instance. It's just a very good suspect. It's just a very James Bond feel to this era, and you can definitely see some James Bond aspects in stories such as The Mind of Evil and The Green Death and so forth. In addition, we get a new companion in Elizabeth Shaw, or Liz Shaw as he's better known as. She's portrayed by, portrayed by the ever so lovely Caroline John. Liz had a good introduction, and I love how she's different to other companions. She's a Cambridge University graduate, and and she's extremely clever, and I believe that she would have had at least equal the Doctor in terms of intelligence. She had a great introduction as well, especially in the first scene. She makes an impact when she pretty much sets at the Brigadier and saying she doesn't want to work for UNED, but when, but when she does meet the Doctor, she becomes interested in working with UNED, and obviously when the Doctor becomes the scientific advisor for UNED, Liz just pretty much assists him. No, 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 and I really like the idea of having one sole companion compared to the two three companions we've had in the past. Unless you look at this one to count the Brigadier as a companion, which I personally don't. Don't. So even though I still like the Brigadier, but I just don't really count him as a companion. I'll explain why in another time. But actually allows the companion to have a good build for themselves, but at the same time it builds a good rapport with the Doctor. And I think per John Pertwee had a good relationship with all three of his companions, and that really... And that's probably one of the reasons why I liked his era. In addition, we have the Brigadier returning, as I mentioned before. In this story, his role is a bit limited compared to other stories. But after the Doctor reaches Unit... Well, his role is kind of limited after the Doctor reaches Unit. And he actually has a great chemistry with the Doctor and Liz. And they made a great trio. And it's a shame that this group doesn't even last. Because Liz doesn't appear after Inferno. She doesn't actually get to an official departure scene. The last we see of this, she's just laughing at the doctor because he landed in the rubbish heap <laughs> with the TARDIS console. <laughs> so on to the side characters of this story. We had Sam Seeley. He was one the one that discovered the nesting meteorite and decided to keep them hidden so he can profit off them. He does a good job, despite the fact that he's not heavily featured. We also have his wife, Meg, Me- Meg Seeley. She was rather fun and she was pretty shaken when she sees an autumn. I don't think they appear shortly afterwards. Yeah. We also had Captain James Monroe. He's a unit soldier. He was a good character. Maybe he could have been like a recurring character. I don't know why he didn't come back. But he's not as good as Benton is. But he's still like a one. But I'm glad he didn't actually die. We had John Ransom. He was the designer of... With Auto Plastics Limited, he was a whilst he was away on his six month sabbatical, Channing took over and Channing started producing autons while he was away. And then, when Ransom returned, he was just he didn't like the autons. And I think he was one of the first characters to actually see the auto, and it was 
coming down and trying to kill him. But he was later killed by an Auton after he told the Brigadier about the Autons. And yeah, he pretty much just... I think he was in the tent and then an Auton comes and just kills the guy. We also had Major General Scobie. He's a British Army officer. He also stood up because he does play a major role in this... In this... In the major part of the story, no pun intended. As he's actually copied by an Auton and the Auton... Auton Scobie is pretty much taking control whilst the real Scobie was... Placed under suspended animation in Madame Two Swords, and that was very creepy to see least how he was just standing there. And the idea of suspended and suspended animation is actually quite creepy, unless they're in, in the pod or something, which is not so creepy. But if they're just there, it, it is actually quite creepy. There are other odd characters here and there, but I rather like these lot, and they're all pretty decent characters to say the least. So now on to the villains of the story. As I mentioned before, this is the first appearance of the Autons and the Nesting Consciousness. The Nesting was just merely a giant squid here, not not, not the C, big CGI blob we saw in Rose in the New Who. And, and the Nesting actually masterminded the Autons, and obviously the Nesting actually controls the Autons. And it's because the Autons are like, I think if I'm I can record, I think they can control living plastic and... Obviously, I've been obviously when you think of the Autons, you think of the shop window dummies you, you often see. But I think Terror of the Autons, the, in the following season, actually establishes the fact that it's not just shop window dummies that can control anything plastic at all. And even the Ninth Doctor has pointed that in Rose, that can pretty much control any form of plastic across the river. Even when Rose, she joked that they could possibly control breast implants. <laughs> So the Autons, they looked really creepy and they looked really menacing considering the fact that they came out of a bloody shop window and started attacking people in the streets of London. And I think that's what Russell C. Davis failed to do when he was writing Rose. He didn't really make them as creepy as Robert Holmes did in this story. So as I mentioned before, the Autons actually returned for Terror of the Autons in the following season. And the Autons were great there, and they, were great, and they were great here as well. Even the nesting was good as was good in this story, but I don't think they have a much larger role in Terror of the Autons. In addition, we had Channing. He was an Auton, but he was different to the Autons that we know because he can actually talk and has a mind of his own, but he still obeyed the nesting consciousness. He was a good villain, and his blank expressions that he gave was actually rather scary. He was destroyed when the Doctor defeated the Nesting and he was a pretty cool villain to say the least. I actually liked him. I don't really have any thought with the story other than if it does take a little bit of its time but it's still enjoyable and I still recommend it. So to conclude this review, Spearhead from Space introduced the Petri era very well and the Unit XR era very well. It might as well, if it was the first ever episode for Doctor Who, you know, in a way it was a first Doctor Who episode of a sort, maybe of a I'll probably say that the Terror Spearhead from Space was probably the first soft reboot for Doctor Who and did it very well. And but if it was the first ever episode for Doctor Who or any other TV show, it probably would have been very good. And then I would say the Spearhead from Space gets a perfect 10 out of 10 for me. My next review will be Doctor Who and the Silurians. Yes, that is the title name because of a script error. And that features the first appearances, the first appearance of the Silurian. So stay tuned for that. Thank you for watching this review. Let me know, please let me know your thoughts of the Spirit from Space and my review of this story. And and also just to add, I'm very looking forward to reviewing the rest of the John Pertwee era because he is my favorite classic Who Doctor, and he does have very good stories. And I would say there's a lot of ten out of ten in his era, to say the least. So. Subscribe to my channel if you're a first time viewer and I'll see you later.